Let's look at this nice problem that was long listed for the International Math Olympiad in 1982. And it involves one of my favorite functions, the floor function. So our goal is to find all natural numbers that cannot be written in the form n plus the floor of the square root of the n plus half for some natural number n. So the first thing that we're gonna do is rephrase this a little bit, and I guess there's really no need to rephrase this, but I think it will just help us notationally like as we move forward. So let's define a function f from natural numbers to natural numbers by f of n equals, well, this expression that we're interested in, n plus the floor of the square root of n plus a half. And then our goal is to determine what the image of f is. In other words, f of the whole natural numbers or everything of the form n plus the floor of n plus a half. And if we can determine everything of that form, well then we know exactly what is not of that form because it's simply the complement of that set in the natural numbers. Okay. So we're going to start by proving the following claim. And maybe step zero of this would be to make a little bit of a chart of what's going on here with some small values of n. Maybe that's a good exercise for you to do. So here's our claim, and that is that f is injective. In other words, it is a one-to-one -one function. Now, let's maybe just recall what that is real quick so that, you know, we're all on the same page. So that says that if f of m equals f of n, then m is equal to n. Okay, great. So now the proof of this claim is pretty quick. And that's because what we'll really show is that f is a strictly increasing function. But if f is a strictly increasing function, well, then it has to be injective. Okay, so let's, like I said, show that f is increasing. So let's suppose that maybe m is less than n. Okay. Well, but that means that the floor of the square root of m plus one half is less than or equal to the floor of the square root of n plus one half. I guess we could have built that a little bit at a time. So if m is less than n, then the square root of m is less than the square root of n. Then you add half and you still have a strict inequality. But then when you take the floor, that inequality may not be strict anymore. For example, if you plug 1 into this setup and 2 into this setup, well, you'll get an equality of the floors. But now what we'll do is simply add like our starting inequality here and this, you know, mid-result inequality, and that'll give us m plus the floor of the square root of m plus one half is less than or equal to n plus the floor of the square root of n plus one half. But of course, over here on the left, we have f of m. Oh, and I should say that this turns into a strict inequality because it, in, it inherits the strictness from our setup. And over here, we have f of n. So let's observe what we have here. We have f of m is strictly less than f of n. And that's actually enough to show that this thing is one to one. It would maybe go something like this. We would do it via contrapositive up here. So let's suppose that m is not equal to n but that tells us that m is less than n or m is greater than n. But then if m is less than n, then f of m is less than f of n by what we just showed. But then also by what we just showed, this means that f of m is bigger than f of n. Then we can just bring this or down. 
But those two inequalities put together tell us that f of m is not equal to f of n. So any way you slice it, you have an injective function. Okay, so let's see how this helps us. Okay, so we just showed that we had an injective function. And now looking over here at the structure of our function or this expression, observe that maybe the bad part of this is the square root. So uh, like a motivated thing or something that's motivated by that fact is perhaps we should plug in a perfect square because if we plug in a perfect square, then the calculation is very simple. So let's just maybe explore by plugging in a perfect square and see what we have. So let's observe that f evaluated at k squared, that's our perfect square. So that's gonna be equal to k squared plus, we have the floor of the square root of k squared plus a half. But then that's gonna be k squared plus the floor of k plus a half. But the floor of k plus a half is pretty clearly equal to k. So here we get k squared plus k. Okay, so that's what's going on here. The image of a perfect square is a perfect square plus, well, the original number. And now, and now we're gonna use that. So let's make the following observation. So if we evaluate f at m minus one squared, so we're gonna evaluate it at two consecutive perfect squares starting with m minus one squared. Okay, so f of m minus one squared, using this formula that we just derived for all perfect squares, that's gonna be m minus one squared minus m minus one. We can factor an m minus one out of that. Sorry, that should be plus m minus one. And we're left with m minus one plus one. So obviously here we get m squared minus m. Okay. And then if we do f of m squared, we get, what do we get? So we get m squared plus m. Okay, great. So now let's put all of this together and see what we really get here. So let's note the following. So if n is between including m minus one squared and m squared, then what we have just shown is that f of n is between m squared plus m and on the bottom end, m squared minus m. So this may not seem helpful at all until you look a little bit closer and observe that there are a different number of possible values in each of these inequalities. So let's look over here. So possible values of n here are, well, how do you calculate that for this sort of, you know, non-strict inequality? Well, it's gonna be the upper bound minus the lower bound plus one. So the number of possible values of n here are m squared minus m minus one squared plus one. But now this is pretty easy to calculate. You get m squared minus m squared minus 2m plus 1 and then plus 1. But then let's see, the m squareds cancel, the 1s cancel, and you get 2m. So there are exactly 2m possible values that n can take. And then let's in parallel do that over here. So let's see, the possible values of f of n, well, so again, that's gonna be the upper bound minus the lower bound plus one. So we have m squared plus m minus m squared minus m plus one, but that's gonna give us two m plus one. But check it out, the possible values of n over here is one less than the possible values of f of n. But well, we also know that f is injective. So that means, well, although that the possible values are 2m plus 1, we only achieve 2n values. So let's write that. So we only achieve 2m values. Again, because it's one to one, we're gonna achieve exactly as many values as we have inputs over here. 
but that means that one of these values is missed. And so now we just have to guess, well, which one is missed? And well, that's gonna form a cascade that will answer this question over here. So if we look at this real quick, well, what's kind of the obvious choice for which one is missed here? I think the obvious choice is the number that is exactly in the middle of this range, which is m squared. And if you did that exploration that I said was probably a good exercise for you guys to do, you would see that the perfect squares seem to be the missed numbers. So let's see if we can prove that. Okay, so what have we shown so far? Well, we showed for every natural number m, if n is between m minus 1 squared and m squared, I guess that should be natural numbers bigger than or equal to 2 since we're subtracting 1 there. We have f of n is between m squared minus m and m squared plus m. But then by a simple counting argument using the fact that f was 1 to 1, we know that f misses exactly one number between m squared minus m and m squared plus m. And, well, the fact that m squared is exactly between these two numbers motivates, well, us to guess that the number that's missed is the perfect square, along with some numerical evidence. So let's make that claim. So the claim is that f of n equal m squared has no solution for n in natural numbers. And I guess I should say here, we know for a fact that any possible solution must come between these two values right here. So m minus one squared less than or equal to n less than or equal to m squared. So we can restrict to that range of natural numbers immediately just by sort of the preparatory results that we've done. Okay, so I guess maybe the first thing to do is try to get as close as possible. And the trick here is to think about like the arithmetic middle versus the geometric middle. So notice that m squared is like the arithmetic middle of m squared minus m and m squared plus m. But since we're doing this square root operation of inputs, we should maybe look at a different type of middle between these two numbers, like a multiplicative middle or a geometric middle. So perhaps we should look at n equals m times m minus 1 and see what we get out of that. So let's do that. So let's set n equal to m times m minus 1. So let's see, let's make our calculation. So f of n will be equal to, well, it's gonna be m squared minus m plus the floor of the square root of m squared minus m. And then what do we have? We have a plus half over here. Okay, nice. And now I'm gonna edit this a little bit that doesn't change the value, but you know helps us in our calculation. So I'm going to multiply this by 4 and this number by 4 as well, and I'm going to do that by multiplying a half here. So the motivation there is to get a perfect square under the square root. But for a perfect square binomial where the coefficient of m squared and the coefficient of m are the same or just negatives of each other, you really need that to be 4. That's because, well, 2 plus 2 is 2 times 2. That's why that works. But then to undo that, we're gonna multiply by 1 half. Okay, great. But now let's observe that that's gonna be strictly less than, well, what I get if I have the same thing, but I add one inside of the radical. So let's add a one inside of the radical here. Good. So, well, why does that give us something that is strictly larger? Well, that's because, well, we'll see that we get a natural number inside of this floor function, but this natural number is larger than what we had here. So the minute you hit a natural number, you get a strict inequality in this direction. Okay, good. 
So now let's observe that the interior of this square root now factors very, very nicely as 2m minus 1 squared. But now what do we have? We have this is equal to m squared minus m, and then we have plus, well, it's going to be the floor of 1 half times 2m, well, that's going to give us m, 1 half times 1, that's going to be minus half and then we have this plus half that's on the outside. But obviously the minus half and the plus half cancel, and the m and the minus m cancel, leaving us with m squared. But look, we don't have f of n equals m squared. We have f of n is strictly less than m squared. So let's maybe put that up here. So if n is equal to that object right there, then f of n is strictly less than m squared. Okay, so now what we want to do is, well, hopefully f of n plus 1 will be strictly bigger than m squared. And thus, well, since there are no natural numbers between n and n plus 1, then we have missed m squared. Okay, so now we're making our calculation with f of n plus 1. So observe that that's going to be m squared minus m plus 1 plus the floor of the square root of, well, we have this thing again. So we have our m squared and then minus m and then plus 1. And then let's see, we're going to have this plus half outside. And I left myself that same gap because we're going to do the same thing, the same like little edit. So I'm going to multiply this by 4 and this by 4. And then, well, that means I also have to multiply this by 4 if I'm not going to change anything. And then I have a half out front. But what I have inside of that radical is no longer a perfect square. But I can replace the 4 that's not attached to an m by a 1, and I create something smaller. But creating something smaller inside of a floor function actually doesn't give you a strict inequality. It gives you a greater than or a less than or equal to. So in this case, the direction we're reading it is greater than or equal to. Then we have m squared minus m plus 1. And then we'll have plus the floor of 1 half times the square root of. Well, if I replace that with a 1 and then factor, I have 2m minus 1 squared and then I've got that plus half on the outside. But now let's see, we can edit this a little bit. The square and the square root will cancel, and we'll be left with m minus half, and then the half and the half cancel, and then we can take the floor of m, which is just m, that'll cancel this minus m, and we'll have m squared plus one. But the really important thing here is that m squared plus one is strictly bigger than m squared. So let's see, bringing that up here, we see that this is strictly less than f of n plus 1. But that's exactly what we needed. We found a value that was strictly less than m squared. The next value was strictly bigger than m squared. And then since f was an increasing function, that means that we'll never get to m squared. So, well, what does that tell us over here? So what natural numbers are not of this form? Well, they're all the perfect squares. And that's a good place to stop.